The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, so today we're going to go over the noise measurement experiment uh, using the microfabricated cantilevers in the atomic force microscope. And uh, we're going to use the high sensitivity of these scopes to try to make an estimate of Boltzmann's constant, which is a uh, physical constant that relates thermal energy to temperature. So um, the basic outline of the experiment is that we're simply going to try to take a uh, measurement of the vibrational noise of the cantilever in the air and then we're going to try to extract information from that vibrational spectrum to calculate Boltzmann's constant. Um, this is based on two different ideas, and uh, let me describe them uh, in a little bit of detail. So what we're going to be talking about the whole time is if we look at a micro cantilever and you let it sit in air, it's going to have some vibration. Um, and with just to keep my variables straight, uh, we're going to use Z for this, for this vibrational uh, amp, uh, positional variable. Okay, so the cantilever is going to vibrate, and it's excited by thermal energy in the ambient air. And nothing else is driving it, and uh, we can take a measurement of this vibration because we have a very sensitive detector, and uh, you can measure this in two different ways. You can measure it in the time domain or in the frequency domain, and you can interconvert between those two things. So the simplest uh, relation that we can take advantage of is the idea that in a second order system, every degree of freedom contains one half kBT of energy, where kBT is Boltzmann's constant that we're trying to measure. So again, this, you'll see this in your lab manual, but Uh, we're going to equate this to the energy present in the vibrational in, in, in this vibrational degree of freedom that the cantilever has. So we're going to represent that as the kinetic energy of this little spring that uh, that vibrates, which is just going to be one half times the spring constant and the mean square uh, vibration of the cantilever. So. Um, this is a very simple relation. Let's make sure we keep these straight. This is Boltzmann's constant. This is the spring constant of the cantilever. And uh, all we would need to do to make this measurement is simply measure this mean square displacement. And that's, the, uh, that's what I've described, the, just the, a time trace of the vibrations. And then we can make an, an algebraic calculation and, and get Boltzmann's constant. And the difficulty, of course, is how accurately can we measure this, and does it truly represent the vibrations of only the cantilever, or does it also include other noise it couples into the system? And so in order to look at that, we're going to transform this into the frequency domain and think about it that way. So it turns out that typically when you take the vibrational spectrum of, of such a second-order resonant device, it looks something like this. Okay, so what this represents is the power spectral density plot of the displacement signal. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details of what power spectral density means. That's uh, hopefully we'll, that has been covered in class. Um, but what we'll normally see is there's a resonant peak that, that represents the first resonance of the cantilever, and then there's a fall off. But there's also some signal up here this section here that doesn't really represent the vibrations of that cantilever and is typically coupled in from things like electronics instrumentation and drift uh, that comes from ambient effects in the room. And so if we take just this time trace and we only record uh, the mean square displacement, this is included in it. Uh, by, if you remember Parseval's theorem, that relates the frequency domain content of a signal to its, to its uh, time domain power. And basically, if you integrate this PSD, you'll get, uh, you'll get the mean square displacement. And so 
so essentially anything you see here will also be in included in the mean square displacement. So this is not the most accurate way to do the, the measurement we want to do and we're going to go into the frequency domain to, to make a more accurate uh, measurement. And what we're going to try to do is record this spectrum and then fit a second order model that just represents the motions of the cantilever to it and hopefully that will allow us to make a more accurate measurement. So I'm just going to draw that on top of this graph. So this green curve is an idealized model system where I'm just representing the vibrations of a second order harmonic uh, oscillator on this, uh, on this actual data. So for reference, I'm also going to draw in a second one of those curves and I'm going to refer to it. If I have a second cantilever that has different dimensions, so it has a higher resonant frequency and is a little bit stiffer, what I'm going to see is that it has a similar shape to it, but its, uh, res its resonance frequency is going to shift and, and the, sort of the baseline here, which we're going to refer to as the thermal mechanical noise limit, is going to be lower. Again, because of this physical principle that the thermal energy of this system should equal one half kBT, the integral under each of these curves for different types of cantilevers should have the same value. So we're also going to get to see that when we test different sizes of cantilevers. Now, that's uh, pretty much what we need to know as far as the theory. So uh, now let's talk about the practical concerns of actually making the measurement and doing it accurately enough to be able to get a good value. Uh, in order to do this, you'll, again, from your lab manual, there's an expression that describes this curve. I'm not going to write it up here, but what, what the salient point is that we're going to want to we're going to want to do two things. One is we're going to need to gather this power spectral data and fit the curve to it. And then we're going to want to extract this value here, the thermomechanical noise limit, which we label as the small delta for each of these cantilevers. And this value then has a simple algebraic relationship uh, to Boltzmann's constant, including some other parameters of the cantilever, like the quality factor of the resonance and the spring constant. So, uh, we had the, the steps of the experiment basically are to get a nice vibrational spectrum, correlate it to physical reality, meaning the vibrational spectrum will be a voltage signal. We need to convert that voltage into nanometers. And then using that plus the other parameters, which are quality factor and spring constant, get your Boltzmann's constant. Um, a few notes about taking a really good vibrational spectrum. So you're, you're pretty familiar by now with doing the, running a force curve and looking at the contact and in con out of contact modes of the cantilever. So it becomes extra important in this case because you want a really, uh, a really good calibration. Um, you want to you wanna have a, a really nice shape to that force curve. So if you see any non-idealities, you want to try to minimize them by adjusting your detector position, your laser focus. Perhaps you might need to change your cantilever if the fingers aren't giving you the best diffractive modes. But you'll want a really nice quality um, force curve, which you can then use to, uh, to calibrate the value. So let me go over that process a little bit uh, in detail again. So I'm just going to draw that, our, our typical force curve here. Again, leaving out the retrace section of it. OK, so what we're interested in essentially here is this point. The rest of the force curve doesn't matter to us today. What we want to know is what is the slope right at this beginning section when the cantilever first comes into contact. And the reason for that is we'll be making this measurement out of contact. So this very first point represents the sensitivity to any changes in signal right at that out of contact place. So biasing your out of contact region to this middle part is going to become very important here. So you don't want it to be anywhere towards the uh, ends of the amplitude. And something that you sometimes see is that this flat section is not, as, not so flat. It might be curved or slanted somehow. And again, those are secondary effects that you'll want to minimize. It might mean having to change the cantilever. It might mean having to readjust the focus, change your position. The position of the sample, that sometimes uh, contributes other optical effects. And then the, the mathematical conversion that you'll want to make 
again, units become uh, units are going to be very important to keep straight in this, and they also will help you kind of uh, guide you through what multiplication and division uh, is is correct at each stage. But essentially, we know that this is the f this is what we always know is that this distance here is 160 nanometers at the diffractive grating. Um, you, can, uh, you can use the more precise value of, I think it's 158.75. Um, uh, and that will give you the conversion factor between the voltage on the, the so the voltage on this axis, this is the uh, Z displacement, piezo displacement axis. And so you'll see this plotted in volts on your, on your oscilloscope and in your scanner uh, software. And that'll give you the conversion. But then you also need the slope of the function right here. Boy, I didn't draw that very well. It's making my drawing difficult. OK. You also want to take the slope of this function which will give you an inner conversion between voltage on this axis and voltage on this axis. So I call that Vy versus Vx. And the, and the reason that you want to do that, of course, is that the signal that you'll then be reading as a power spectrum, once you convert to the power spectrum, is the, the Y voltage signal. So it's important to remember that the slope, uh, the slope is what makes this relationship. Now another way to, to do that is to just make a quick kind of back of the envelope estimate from basically the peak and trough points and just approximate this as a straight line. Um, but, you'll, but obviously that's a little bit less accurate. So that'll give you the, cal the calibration for what the voltage to nanometer conversion is as the cantilever vibrates. And then you also have to remember your geometric correction factor based on the position of the laser spot on the fingers compared to where the, what, how the tip motion, uh, uh, how the tip moves. And again, uh, it's useful to try to, position, uh, try to position your laser spot as close to the edge of the diffraction grating as possible so that you'll be able to more accurately measure the position of that spot relative to the tip. Um, so and then the last, uh, the last two kind of variables that play into it are the quality factor, which you'll be able to extract from making the fit to the power spectral density. So that's a fairly easy thing to, to accurately measure. Um, and the resonant frequency of the cantilever, of course. And the spring constant. So we're going to make the assumption that we can calculate the spring constant with, with high accuracy um, from the two different methods that are given in your lab manual. One is based on measuring the frequency and one is based on purely geometrical factors. You can make all of those calculations and compare them to each other and see how much you believe each of them. Um, and then uh, that'll play into your calculation for Boltzmann's constant. That should take care of the introduction. Now let's get to measuring. And point eight. Uh, Pi. So this is B, this is H. I guess this is called big L. Um, what else do we need to know? Oh, right, just to make it easier on yourselves, this is going to have an omega naught of approximately 9 kilohertz, and this one approximately 14. Um, just so you, uh, a lot of people will put in a cantilever on the spectrum, what size do I have? You can tell instantly by the resonant frequency. Um, okay, then that's it. And then the rest basically depends on a really nice force curve and some careful math. And can you give them the spring constants of each one? No, they, they'll, they can calculate them pretty well. I mean, once you've measured the resonant frequency, you can actually get the spring constant pretty well from that Seder, Seder expression. Um, OK. Um, so I want to say a quick word about, uh, about how to get your cantilevers 
to about how to position your cantilevers to get the force, spec force curve that you want. So when we were using the imaging cantilevers when we had the long middle beam, it's easy to just deflect that beam on its own and the side beams don't move. But now that we have two identical cantilevers for these measurements, uh, you need to deflect one and leave the other one unbent so that it acts as a reference when you're actually doing your calibration and your force curves. So as the picture shows in your lab manual, I'm just going to do a sort of a dramatization here. Basically, if you have the two cantilevers, what you want to do is you want to, so I'm going to lower them down, but you want to bring up the stage with the sample such that one of the cantilevers will contact the sample and bend, and the other one will remain unbent. So that's all you're trying to do. And with your stereo microscope, that should become reasonably easy. So again, just bring one down, keep the other one straight, and then release. That's going to be your force curve. Okay. I think these are them. Yeah, so there, there's these little bits of glass that are mounted on the, the pucks, and you can just plug one of those in, and then they'll typically have a nice sharp corner you can use. Otherwise, it's kind of hard to find a corner on the regular samples. So grab one of these, and then grab whatever cantilever size you like, and uh, go forth.